You know what you don't do? You don't make any excuses. The greatest player I ever played with is Larry Bird. Like, I got to have your back. Are we going to have agreements, disagreements? Yes. Are we going to, you know, get into it sometimes and have arguments? Yes. But I got your back. D, welcome to the Jedberg man, Podcast. Man, thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It's an absolute honor. We're here <laughs> day, day two, Sandlot yeah. Jacks 2023. Yeah. Gorick Games are in full effect. Yep. You just got off the stage mm -hmm. giving your fit talk, and you agreed the other day when I hit you up to come yep. over here, yep. sit down with me in the back of the 1944 Dodge. You've done a lot of things in your life. Yep. We were joking. You never did this. <laughs> never done this. This is a great truck. I mean, number one, it covers me because it's hot outside. I don't know how these people are doing this. Bro the go rock stuff it's crazy but no, this, this is a great environment to do a podcast well what we're, what we're not telling you is you're next after this <laughs> oh, so we're so we signed you up i got, I got my pack I got my, I got my pack. i'm ready to go <laughs> it's an absolute honor to yep, sit here sure. with you so i told you the other day i'm from boston yep. grew up outside the city yep. in weston i think uh -huh. you you had some experiences in wellesley yep, yep, i yep, understand yep. but I watched you as a kid growing up. You played at a at a time. I mean, the Celtics are a dynasty. I'm going to ask right, you about yeah. that and what it takes to build a team like that. Yeah. But I remember watching you as a kid and right. with Kevin McHale <laughs> yeah. and Larry Bird yeah, and the, yeah, uh, yeah. the whole team. Yeah. And so when when I saw you were coming here, I'm like, yes, all right, that's the that's the number one yeah. target oh, right man, there. So, <laughs> so a, a kid's dream yeah. here coming true oh, in the back it. of this yeah. uh, back of this yeah. truck. Long time an NBA player mm -hmm. you've been around the sport around the league yeah. for over 30 years yeah. mm -hmm. as a player as an executive as a coach mm -hmm. coach in the WNBA yeah, yeah, as right, well right. and you so you've covered all aspects of this yeah. thing but I want to take it back to the beginning yeah. I want to start right here in Jackson right yeah was where it all began yeah. Yeah. Where, where it all began and you go into the NBA draft in 1990 and mm -hmm. the Celtics pick you right What's that feeling like? It's special because I was a, a, a NBA buff. Like, I was a history buff. So I knew, I remember watching the Lakers and Celtics playing every Sunday on CBS with Tommy Heinsohn, you know, that that loved the Celtics and, and would be rooting against. He would be doing a national telecast, but rooting for the Celtics at the same time <laughs> against Magic Johnson and, 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 and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and James Worthy and that group. So when I got drafted by the Celtics, to be able to hear your name, uh, Red Arbach, who, who's a, obviously – the patriarch of the Celtics, you know. Legendary. Uh, legendary, like built that from the ground up all the way back to, to Bill Russell. To hear a guy like that call your name and say he wants you to be a part of that, you know, storied franchise it was like the best feeling. That, to me, that was better than winning the slam dunk competition because you had a person that been around championships all his life, build, like you said, build a dynasty and, 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 and franchise that's still, to me, the greatest sports franchise in, in the world. Um, call your name. I couldn't wait to get up there. And then you get a chance to play with Larry Bird, Kevin McHale, Robert Parrish, be mentored by Dennis Johnson, see all these Hall of Famers every day at practice. You know, a kid from Jacksonville, the first time I ever left home, first time I ever really saw snow. <laughs> when I got to Boston, you know, I had no clue what an ice scraper was. I had a, yeah. I had a spatula <laughs> cleaning my windows. So it was, it was a great experience and it was a great growth for me as, as a young man coming from Jacksonville to go to Boston. I want to ask you about day one yeah. all right and, and i say this because we talk so many times about what happens in, in special forces right. after selection yes. you know and i've spoken with uh, I, a few weeks ago i had the honor to sit down with julius thomas two-time pro bowler right. from yeah. the nfl right. and ask him this very similar question right. but you get selected in the draft right. and now you have to show up yeah. you get selected to be a green beret right. Right. you get through the training you show up right. to your unit yeah but you're the new guy. Yeah. <laughs> right? And so many people they think that the culmination mm. is when they get when they get picked. Right, right. But it's really just the start. Yes. Yeah. So talk about walking into that locker room and all of these legends right. who had succeeded and done right. so much and you are the new guy yeah. and you don't know shit. Right, exactly. You go from again, you go from being the big fish to the small fish real quick. You walk in the locker room and you've got literally, you know, I don't know the comparison in the military is, you got five Hall of Famers here. <laughs> Playing with, number one, you've got eight to nine that's every day at practice. So you've got Red Arbach, John Havlicek, Bob Cousy, Tommy Heinsohn, Sam Jones, KC Jones, every day at practice, not every other day, every day at practice. So you're walking on the court, walking in the locker room, and you're looking around. These guys have achieved so much. You see all these banners in the, in, in, in the, in the old Boston Garden when you're playing. You know what you don't do? You don't make any excuses. 
There's there's not an excuse you can make. Well, this is too hard, or you know, practice is too long. And why are you doing this? My grandfather told me first, first when I first got to Boston, you make sure you learn how to get past hard from day one. It's going to be hard. You're a rookie. They're going you're going to be required to do things that you're probably not used to doing. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it's like being a freshman in high school. You got you're the new guy. You got to go get the donuts. You got to go get them a newspaper. <laughs> you got to wash their clothes sometimes. You got to pick up their bags on the road. Um, and it's a maturation process, and you and you earn their respect, and that's what you want to do. You want to go out there and play as hard as you could, be about the right things, being selfless, team first, uh, value winning, coachable, mental and physically tough. Those things are part of my DNA, and I learned that by being around great people every day who's done it at a high level before I got there. So I had no excuse to yeah. not be successful, or not excuse to do the little things, dive on the floor, uh, you know, get loose balls. Uh, so it's your first day in that locker room, you're looking around, they've done that. They've shown how it works. So I always say greatness leaves footprints. Greatness, they leave footprints. And you either you could choose not to follow the footprints or try to make it on your own. You still might get to your end goal, but why not follow greatness? And I was yeah. in, around greatness every day. Yeah. Like nobody, a lot of people can't say that. And, and that, that helped me out early in my career that's an opportunity yes an opportunity to, that you have to see you have to take it you now if you're selfish you think you can change it or you can be different you know well i'm not doing that everybody else did that well i'm following greatness i mean 16 banners well there's there's some kind of uh common commonality to 16 banners you know a lot of people can't say that only one team can say they got as many championships as, as the celtics that's the lakers yeah. uh so you're around that every day. Take the opportunity, open up your mind, growth. That's part of your growth of, of, of understanding uh, when knowledge is there, be open and, and, and be ready to receive it in a positive way and not a, a reluctant way where you think you're just doing it because you're trying to check a box. So I told you that you're the you're the first NBA player that we've had yes, on the podcast. Yes, thank you. So I, special. It, it, it's ta it's <laughs> taken 120 plus episodes to get it, but we've had a number of, of NFL players. Right. And I always, and I've been very fortunate to have people on who've played with the with the best, with Tom Brady, yeah, with yeah. Peyton Manning, mm -hmm. and they talk about their work ethic. Yes, yes. Talk about the work ethic that was ingrained in you. We said it was an opportunity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what did you learn from the greats about not what happens necessarily in practice, right. but when that practice ends mm -hmm. and the mandated time is over, Right. it's the rest of the work yes. that creates the championship. Uh, you know, the greatest player I ever played with is Larry Bird. Not even a question. Um, I played with some great players, some great young players. I got a chance to play with a young Vince Carter, Tracy McGrady, played with Reggie Lewis. Play, I played with some great players. Larry Bird was the best player I ever played with. Why? Because it, it wasn't so much his skill set. It was, like you said, his preparation to be great. He was prepared to be great before the lights came on, before everybody showed up. He was always the first one to practice, the last one to leave. Every story you hear about Larry Bird is true. I tried to beat him into practice my first my rookie year. Couldn't do it because he wouldn't he wouldn't let me win. Just little things like that. I'm not letting a rookie beat me to practice. That's my thing. Four o'clock there. Three o'clock in the morning there. Didn't matter. Uh, that's was his that was his DNA. So when you see things like that, you understood that it took more than just showing up at the games, watching film. It was a mindset. You know, his mindset was all right. I can be intentional in what I do, and know I have to have a plan in action what I'm doing. And then I have, then I have to be attentive to what I'm doing. How do I get to that point? He was very into, in, uh, intentional and he paid a lot of attention to being great. And it was always when nobody's watching. He yeah. got great when nobody's watching. And I got a chance to see that firsthand where he would, ha he would, he would allow me, <laughs> let me say it this way. He allowed me to shoot and rebound with him for two or three hours after practice. And it, it, it made me just understand how hard it is to be great every day. And he saw the development. Yes. That he's, and he took it upon himself, though, to also say, you know, I have a responsibility right. yes. to develop the rest of this team. Yes. We talk about team ability mm -hmm. and, you know, and, the, and the team ability being the teamwork right. part of elite performance. Yes. Often when you're great and you know, because I mean, you know, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's not, yeah, like yeah, he, yeah, no. not like he woke up every day and was <laughs> like, man, I hope to be great. Right. But he had the drive, yes. you know, drive yes. another one of those characteristics yeah, we yeah. talk about in special operations. Yeah. But the the true greats 
take it upon themselves yes. yeah. to say, I have a responsibility to everybody around mm -hmm. me to also make them great, yes. yeah. especially the new guys. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the culture that was built there and it filtered down from the top. Like you said, leadership is called servant leadership. Like he was a very, as good as he was, you hear all the trash talking stories about Larry Bird. He was a servant leader. Like he, he would challenge you to be great and he would put you in positions to not, almost to fail, like you want to be, but not to fail in a situation, in a, in a way where you couldn't bounce back and figure out what you're doing wrong. Mm -hmm. And he was, he was unbelievable like that. And those are the unique leaders. The unique leaders that, that get you to do things that you're not comfortable with doing. Yeah. You know, you hear, you hear it all the time. You got to be comfortable being uncomfortable. He would challenge you every day in practice. It was not our best games were practice, not the games. It was practice because, you know, the Allen Iverson, we talk about practice. He, we love practice because he got after us he showed, he did by actions. We call it, we used to call it praxis. His actions and his behaviors dictated and determined his values and his goals. So when you showed up every day and your actions and your behaviors did that, all you did, you had to fall in line. Or you're, you're basically an, an, an outlier, a sore thumb. Yeah. You wasn't there long, trust me. There, get this guy out of here. He's not part of what we're trying to do. Um, and that's a very, very unique trait to have. Everybody doesn't have that trait. Add it to a point. But like you said, the Larry Bird, the Magic Johnsons, the great generals in, in the military, yeah. they have that, they have that, that, that it that you can't teach. There's no leadership school you can go to. It's walk up. Like you said, wake up. I know I'm great. How do I make others great? Yeah. 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 And then find the things that they can continuously improve. Yes. You know, we talk about curiosity. Yes. You know, a lot. It's another one of those fund those characteristic yep. fundamentals yes. is can, do I still have the curiosity yes. in yes. my mind? Right. And because that's what allows you to have a sustainable career yes. over a long exactly. time. You know, I want to talk about post basketball as a player right. for you, too, because mm -hmm. I think the curiosity piece is really important yeah. because yeah. So many players do great things in the league, mm. and they and they go do other right, things. Right, I mean, yeah. I, 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 and, and all, Austin, oh, Shaquille yeah. O'Neal is like yeah, one yeah. of the greatest entrepreneurs. Yeah. Johnson, <laughs> I mean, you know, you know they, they own a hundred thousand businesses. Oh, yeah, they're great, <laughs> and, I, and I think that comes from again, it's, it's like you said, it's it's, it's being intu intuitive. It's always want to be great. Like you, when you're at, you, you don't all of a sudden become older and stop the competitive nature and spirit. That doesn't quit. Like. I'm still a competitor. If I'm if I'm walking to that fence and it's a race, I'm trying to beat you to that <laughs> fence. I might not, there, maybe not, no, no, no trophy at the end, or no money at the end. But that's a competitive nature. And even when I retired, I wanted to be in a competitive in a situation where I challenge other people. I challenge myself uh, from player development, from life development, from career skills, from career development. Those things were challenging to me, and I loved it. I enjoyed doing that part because I knew I was very good at it. I can, I call myself like a, like a, a mentor of men. I try to do that because I, hopefully my actions and my behaviors duplicate exactly what I was saying to them every day. And you see all the great people who are in great businesses, they do that. They just know how to, to cultivate and, and galvanize people. I, I try to do that behind the scenes where people are better versus themselves yeah. as they grow into their space they want to grow to uh, as they get older. How was the transition? It was easy for me. Was it? Because I, I was blessed, literally. I was blessed to be in our organization. Because it was a, when I came out, it was an old league. All your superstars were 27, 28, married with kids. You know, some of the kids I was playing with, babysitting, <laughs> doing practice after practice, you know. Uh, so I got a chance to grow up real fast. And understand the importance of family, you know, balance, knowing how to work hard, put your time in, but also, understand how important your family was how to spend time on yourself uh and a lot of a lot of young guys don't get the opportunity they just kind of no. get thrown in the fire figure it out just yeah. sink or swim uh, I, I didn't get put in that situation in boston um so when i got ready to retire i always said i'm gonna retire on my own terms not when the uniform falls off me i'm gonna take it off and give it to them and go listen right. you can have this back <laughs> i got something else to do and that's exactly what i did i i remember going to my general manager's office and i was at orlando magic it was my 12th year, and I was like, man, my knees are killing me, my hips are killing me, I can't do it anymore. And I went to his office, and I was still under contract. Yeah. I said, listen, I can't give what I want to give. And it, it, it's unfair to you, unfair to my teammates. I was the captain of the team. I said, I'm retiring. And the first thing he goes, are you sure? I go, yeah. He goes, okay, your office is down the hall. <laughs> I had a job the next day, the same day. Had a job, because they knew what I was stood about. Right. They knew that I was prepared to teach these next generation players, staff members, whoever it was, 
to be professionals, uh, to understand, you know, how life works after you're done playing. So my transfers were very easy. My general manager at that time, John Gabriel, Orlando Magic, as soon as I retired, I was right in the front office the next day. How do you make that transition, right? Because yeah. we talk about going from <laughs> peers, right? Yeah, you're there yeah. with the players. Yeah. You're all peers. Yeah. And now you're now you're one of them. Yeah, yeah, now uh, you're the man. That's the toughest part. <laughs> that's the toughest part because, again, you, you got to stop thinking like a player and start thinking like a, a manager, uh-huh. a coach, an executive. And it's always that thin line between, you know, uh, them respecting me and, 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 and also a line between no, they know. Like, I can tell you, oh, I know how you feel. I've been there, done that. I've sat in that chair before. I was there yesterday. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I, I got a funny story with that one. So, so it, it earns a level of trust. You know, they trust you. Because when you say I've done that and been there, yeah, you have. So when I say something, it, got, it holds them a little more weight. So while I was in the front office, Doc Rivers was a coach. Uh-huh. And we had a lot of injuries that year. So I'm in my office working. Doc Rivers comes to my office and goes, hey, what kind of shape you in? I'm in, I'm in great shape. I just retired. You know, I kind of feel good because I've been playing half the year. He goes, I need you to come play. I go, what? I left my office and signed a 10-day contract and played 10 days. And I've been down, played for like two two weeks. Everybody got healthy and went back to my office. So I was prepared, but it was a trust. They believed in me. They understood. I knew what was going on. I think that's the last year that you can retire and come back and play. I think they changed the rule after that. So, again, that transition was there, uh, and it wasn't hard because I prepared myself uh, to do other things other than basketball. Uh, but it, it was funny when they knew I was right there. They trusted me, like, come on down. Came down, went back up, went back to my job, so it was great. Let's talk about coaching. Yes. Because you take you, got, you have a perspective as the player, right? right? But so much comes down to coaching Mm -hmm. you know like we talk about you you reference generals right you know and and what's the job of the coach right right? especially at that level you know because i think about how amazing these players are Mm -hmm. i mean you've taken millions and millions of shots you know how you should (laughs) you know and so we we say okay well the the coach of an nba team you know are how much are they focusing on you know, the technical aspect right, of yeah, things yeah. versus having to get the team to gel together yeah, yeah. and trust each other and play with each other. So you have you know the skill, mm-hmm. and then you have the hard skill, right, yep. and then you have the soft skill. Yes, yes, of, yes. You know, these yep. guys, can I can take the five <laughs> best players, one right. through five in the league, put them in the same team, and they could be horrible. Yes, and you've seen that plenty of times. And that's the hardest part about coaching because, to me, I always say this uh, when I'm speaking to people, all coaches can't teach, but all teachers can coach. Mm-hmm. Because you understand how to pass on information. The best players that ever played the NBA were probably the worst coaches. You know why? <laughs> it became too easy for them. Think right. about it. Go down a list of great NBA players that became coaches. They were horrible because it became so easy to them. They could not translate the information that was in their head, in their heart, to, to teachable moments, broken down to the simplest form where I can understand. You know, like, they just didn't, they couldn't do that. And you have to know how to, like you said, the soft skills, relationals, professional skills, emotional skills, mental skills, how to translate that. You have to understand where you have to meet people where they are. And coaches have to do that. They're managers, they're babysitters, uh, they're psychologists. <laughs> I mean, they're all those things above. And they're tacticians. You know, there's a tactical part, X and O's, drop a play, we score. But the soft skills, Phil Jackson was great at the soft skills. He knew how to handle Dennis Rodman, but also not to handle Michael Jordan. <laughs> right. Like that's that's a very big yeah. spectrum of personalities. Uh, you know, my coach I had in Boston, Chris Ford, he knew how to handle Larry Bird, but also knew how to handle you know, Ed Pinkney. You know, um, and a lot of people can't do that because again, they don't have a a, a authentic authentic relationship with their players. Uh-huh. And great coaches have an authentic relationship with their players because they they know you care. So I'm gonna push you. So when I do push you, you know it's for the right reasons. Right. And it ain't selfish. There's no agenda attached. Uh, and when coaches can take their personal agenda off the table and players see that, they'll do whatever. Doc Rivers is one of the greatest people coaches, player coaches, people say, you know, a player's coach. Why is he a player's coach? Not because he he's a yes man to, and, and lets them do what they want to do. He meets them where they are, and then he galvanizes them, uh, motivates them, and be the best version of themselves. And whatever that is, 
for the, 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 the betterment of the team, for the group. You know, it's a team sport. It's not tennis. It ain't golf. It's basketball. Coaches know how to do that, and the great coaches do that, and that's always a hard balance to do because there's a lot of great basketball tactical minds, but they don't know how to deal with people on an everyday basis, which is always the toughest part with all the different different personalities and things. You had the opportunity to coach and, and work with players in the NBA and in the WNBA. Yes. Talk for a minute about the difference between coaching right. women, women yep. and coaching men. Yeah, the, 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 obviously the physical nature is different. On the women's side, the game's played below the rim. So everything was done from the floor up. Fundamentals, these, these fundamentals, how to come off a screen, how to use a pick, how to make certain passes. Because you wasn't using your athletic ability after a mistake to go jump 10 feet to the rim and block a shot. You right. gotta know how to slide your feet, rotations. So it was a lot of teaching. When I coached the WNBA, the first thing the girl said to me, do not water it down. <laughs> Coach us like you're coaching men. And I was like, we'll do, we'll do. Men on the other hand, it's transactional. What can you do for me? How are you going to make me look me? <laughs> On the women's side, it's relational. You know, how are you feeling today? Is everything good? And that was a little bit of the difference because I can ask a simple question. I asked a guy, how are you doing today? Fine. Okay, that was it. I asked one of my female players, how are you doing today? Well, <laughs> it's like a 15-minute rant. I'm like, okay, wait a minute. Let me reframe the question. Are you doing okay today? That's a yes or no question. <laughs> so you learn about different, and it helped me. You know what it did? It helped me be a better dad. So I have three daughters. Yep. My oldest daughter plays in WNBA. Another daughter plays college basketball at William and Mary. So being around women's sports, I'm, I was originally one of those original girl dads. I it taught me how to be um, relational, have have conversations, how to listen, yep. um, how to translate my feelings into things where it wasn't a a tone, a tone thing. Raise my voice, use curse words, because you don't want to teach, you don't talk to women like that, because I don't want somebody talking to my daughter that way. Yeah. But men, like I said, when it's transactional, what can you do for me? Are you making me look good? I got, I'm playing for a contract. So it was, it was different, but I enjoyed both moments. I enjoy coaching women more, because I got a chance to express and teach and grow, uh, because it, 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 it challenged yourself yeah. on how to do certain things uh, that wasn't just, hey, Go up there, throw an alley-oop, go dunk it, and we're done. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I think that difference starts from a young age. Yes. So so my daughter's 13. Yeah. <laughs> she plays lacrosse. Uh -huh. My son is three. Yeah. And actually, this morning was his first soccer. Oh, awesome. <laughs> so I, I, unfortunately, I was here, so right. I missed it, which hurts a little oh, bit. Sure. But, oh, yeah. but it's okay. There will be more. <laughs> but my daughter comes home every day from lacrosse, right. and she talks about you know, the conversations they had. <laughs> yeah, she yeah, talks yeah. about, you know, how they're going to do their, the eye, eye black yeah. for the game and how they're going to do their, <laughs> their hair. hair. My yeah. son is three and he's on his way to practice. And he says to me the other day, I yeah. said, you know, Adrian, you're going to first soccer practice yeah. this weekend. And he says, dad, I'm going to beat them and win. <laughs> That's it. That's all. <laughs> That's no, it. Done. done. Yeah. <laughs> done. Transactional. <laughs> Very tragic. On wins and losses. Or we're, we're going to have a conversation. we have a good time on the women's side. But we're going to compete. I, I agree with you 100%. And it starts at an early age. And those conversations need to be had with young kids. They understand. There's transactional relationships you have. And there's relational relationships you have. And knowing the difference and how to manage those things. Yeah. What's the biggest thing you take away from being a player? Teamwork. How hard it is to be a a a down for your guy, thick and thin, and I, I never, I can never, I can never imagine the things that you guys in the military go through in life or death situations, and being there and go, you know what? I'm putting my, I'm putting my life on the line for you. No questions asked. Run through that wall. You're not asking what's behind the wall. You just run through it because you know that person next to you, in the bunker, has your back. That's what I learned from sports, being a teammate. Like, I gotta have your back. Are we gonna have agreements, disagreements? Yes. Are we gonna, you know, get into it sometimes and have arguments? Yes. But I got your back. The six most important words I learned from sports, and I was right in the locker room and the, the board when I was coaching, I will not let you down. If you can say that every day when you step in the locker room, you was in a bunker, I will not let you down, it puts all the onus on you supporting your teammate, your, you know, your military buddy, whoever it is, your family member, brother and sister, that's what I learned. I will not let you down. If you can say that to yourself um, on an everyday basis, guess what it does? It makes you more conscious of other people. 
It makes you more empathetic. It makes you more conscious of what's going on in the world because it ain't about you. Yeah. Yeah, I'll add in the word trust yes. into that because yep. what does it, it breed? Yeah. It breeds it trust. Yes. And when I know that you've gone through the same thing that I have, yeah. when I know that no matter what happens, you're going to be there standing yeah. alongside me, yeah. it builds trust. trust. And whether we succeed, whether we fail, right. Right. we're going to do it together. Right. You know, we, we're at the fitness festival. Yes. So yesterday we did a workout with a couple of the, with a couple of the guys that I had on the, uh -huh. on the show. And after we were joking and we were saying, you know, what is it about that workout that now we're, we're joking and we're laughing? Yeah. I'm like, well, it was the fact that we did it. I don't know. I didn't know you guys right. until you walked up here. <laughs> right. And one, one of the guys didn't even know I was going to ask him to do it. <laughs> right. right. But I looked at him and I said, you want to do this? And he said, yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah. And then now we got something to talk about right. because we both gave everything we had yes. and laid out on the ground yes, after. Exactly. Yep. In five minutes. In five minutes. That quick. You build trust. You build authentic relationship with somebody because you're, it wasn't about you. It was about the group. We did something together that we can challenge each other together. And that's what people want. That's what people want. That's what's going on right now in this world. You know, we, we have to start the real, real FaceTime, not phone FaceTime, real FaceTime with yeah. people and having authentic conversations and listening to people and meeting where they are. And then all of a sudden, like, you know what? I got you. I got your back. Let's do this together. And people, it, it's like very separated. You know, if it's political, if it's whatever, it is, whatever, whatever it is, we're people. We've got a, it's a race, and it's about the human race. And I'm, I'm, I'm very adamant about that. That's very important to me. Let's, let's treat each other like humans, and then we'll figure out the rest later. How do you manage the egos? Ooh, uh, th 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 that's, always, that's always a challenge. Um, and and it, sometimes it just needs, it needs to be an individual part where you're talking to a great player who thinks they know everything or can do everything. As a coach, you almost have to put them in a position to fail where you can build them back up. You know, not degrading, not life-threatening, but you put them in a situation like you don't know everything. And just, you got to, you said it, you got to trust me. Yeah. You know, you got to trust me. So as soon as you don't trust me, I can't help you because you already have a guard up or your wall up. And building ego, tearing, you don't want to tear down somebody's ego because we all got to our... Where we are with ego. I got an ego. It might you, not you, be, have you, you have to. Have, you have to have in ego. In anything you do, you whether you're have, a player, you're a business or entrepreneur. You have to have an ego. Now, if that ego is not aligned with the group and the mission or the vision or your core values, then it has to be called out. And it's called out because now it's not about you. And that's the hardest part is, is letting people understand, unless you're playing, again, individual sport, you can have the ego you want to and you can yell at your coach, whatever, and you go back. But that's always the hardest part is managing egos. And the way you do that is you have to listen. And then you not listen to respond, you listen to understand where they're coming from. That why do you have this ego? And why do you feel this way? And why are you guard it? And, and, and why you have your guard, you know, why you have this wall up? Let's break that down. Once you start deal, like we call it a deep dive, once you start deep diving into those kind of conversations, the ego kind of changes a little bit. Not that they're still don't think they're great, but they trust you more. And once they trust you, you can get at them a little bit more than you did in the past. How has the player changed over the last 30 years? Social media. <laughs> <laughs> it's changed because everybody's a brand now. Yeah. Everybody's a brand. Um, I remember when I won the dunk contest, I was, I was with Reebok and I pumped out my shoes. I only did it because it was a competition. I didn't do it for brand recognition. I was a Reebok athlete anyway. I didn't know how big it was going to be. 30 years, 30 years later, I'm, we're still talking about it. Well, I'm going to have Paul Litchfield yeah, on here yeah, tomorrow who invented the shoe. Exactly. <laughs> Me and Paul have funny stories about the shoe and about how I put it on the map. And I got a new shoe coming out today uh, with Reebok. So it's, it's crazy, like 30 years later, that we're still talking about it. But the athlete now, we talk about life after sports. And it's important. You know, be prepared for when, they, you know, when Father Time's undefeated. You're going to stop playing. <laughs> all right? You're going to stop playing. So prepare yourself for life after sports. It started at such a young age with brand recognition, NIL deals, um, you know, social media, uh, you know, being known all over the world. Like before, you would do something in Jacksonville, and somebody in California would not know about it for two weeks later. Newspaper, an article, USA Today. <laughs> now it's real time. So if you do something good, bad, or different, real time, they know about it. So people are so protective of their brand, of, of themselves. And sometimes that takes away from the team environment because you're just trying to build yourself. Athletes are 
as athletic, more athletic. You know, you got these guys that were 6'9", 6'10", you know, jumping 48 inches off the floor with a 4'4", you know, 40. It's different. They're different. Um, but I think it, the social media has made life such a unrealistic view of what things you go through. I like the tough times. Yeah. I want to show people the tough times because that's what most people go through. Everything is not what you see on social media. So I think a lot of that hinders our growth sometimes. We don't have conversations with younger kids. Uh, these athletes, they're special. They're different. Um, but, again, it, it's about, like you said, it's having these conversations at a young age. What's important? What's your, nego what's your negotiables? And what's your non-negotiables in life? And once you kind of figure those things out, I think, uh, you know, these athletes obviously are, are doing a great job of, of, of growing their brand. But you don't want to make sure it hinders – the bigger brand, which is, you know, a team sport, an organization, a company, a corporation. You don't want that to happen. Your son is following in your footsteps. Yeah, yeah. He's at University of Jacksonville yeah, now. Yeah. What do you tell him? Uh, well, he, the, the crazy part is that he's at Bowles, too, when I went to high school. And my numbers were tired there. And he was a little, he was a little at, uneasy at first because he's like, everybody's going to compare me to you. You know, I can't be as good as you. We had a, we had a hard, hard conversation. I go, listen. This is, that's not about me. It's about you. It's your journey, you know, and I'm always going to be dad first, not coach, not D Brown, who's in the Hall of Fame at, at, at the school or I would be dad first. So we're going to have authentic conversations about your game, your life, your growth. We don't talk about the NBA in my house. We talk about your next step. His next step is going to college. Uh, and he wanted to go to JU because he loves the city. He loves the coaching staff. Um, and he finally embraced being my son and said, listen, Dad, I'm going to be better than you. <laughs> okay, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I've been waiting for. I'm going to be better than you. I'm breaking all your records. That's what I've been waiting for. So on his own accord, he figured out that he wanted to be better than me. And I say, listen, be better than me. This is what you're about. And it was, uh, it was, a, it was a great feeling to him say that, and I enjoy that. So him following follow my footsteps to me, I think, you know, he'll end up Hopefully, you know, it's, it's good or better than I was ever at Jacksonville University. You're at, you're at the university yeah, as well. Yeah. So uh, as the director of university athletic relations, mm -hmm. how's that transition been? It's been good. You know, I, I, I worked in pro sports for the last 30 years, 12 as a player, and that 18 after that as a front office executive we talked about earlier. And I did a lot of personal and professional development for our young players in the NBA. And it gets to a point where they just, you know, they're older, they have so many people around them, agents, you know, family members. You know, I say, you know, I, I need to go to an environment that that's what it's all about. It's about growth. Ages 18 to 23, in a learning environment on, on, on campus, the president approached me a couple years ago before I even thought about it. He goes, hey, once you come back to university, be in a leadership role, these people and these students need your guidance. They need your leadership, your growth, your experiences. Um, Cause I did it for so long. So I love what I'm doing. You know, I get a chance to be around these young, you know, minds that, that, that want information. They want to grow, they want to be better. They're in my office asking me questions if it's about financial growth, professional growth, mental growth, emotional growth, whatever growth, the relational growth. And I give my experiences, we do curriculums, I do workshops with our head coaches, our assistant coaches, administrators. It's right down. It's right. It's right down my yeah. pathway. It, it's really like I love developing. I love to see people grow and be a better version of themselves every day. Whatever it is, one step at a time. Uh, and to be able to be on campus, be back at your alma mater, to do that, see your number in the rafters, and people half of me don't even know who I am. Like some of these kids have no clue. They tell their parents. Their parents are like, you don't know who that is. I'm like, wow, I'm old. Like I got the parents excited, but the kids are not. So, but, it, but it's it's great uh, to be back. And to be able to give back all the information and, and, and resources back to our student athletes. Well, you talked about servant leadership. Yes. You know, and that, that embodies servant leadership. Yes. We talk about effective intelligence right. a lot, another one of those characteristics yep. because you know, that's the aggregate, how you use the aggregate experiences that you've had in your life, yes. in your career, to make decisions on the future, yep. right? In an informed manner that right. then empower your organization. Right. And that's what now you have the opportunity yeah, to do. Yeah, I love doing it. It's the best part of being able to pass that on information. If you take it or not, it's fine. I want to impact. I know I can impact all 50, 550 of our student athletes, and if I can pack one, that's a win. If I can get that double and double every year, 
those are those are winning moments for me. Yeah. Those are my winning moments. Yeah. Not winning the dunk contest, not making a three pointer at the buzzer. My winning moments is having the kid come in and go. This is the best experience I ever had in my life being at this university because you poured into me. You cared about me. Win. That that is my winning moments right now. Not on athletic or, or, or the field. Yeah. You talked about the dunk contest. Yeah. We've all seen it. The, the pumping up yeah, of the, yeah. the, the, the Reebok pump. Yeah. And I tell you, we're going to have Paul on yeah. tomorrow. <laughs> you, you did, you, and you talked about, you brought up the shoe. They're yeah. releasing a new shoe. Because yeah. the, they were so popular when they came <laughs> right, out. Right. They went away for a long time. Yeah, and they're yeah. coming back. Yeah. What's what's the new shoe? What What's going on with it? Well, it's a new shoe. It's a pump shoe. And it's, and it's a collaboration between me and Alan Iverson. So it's a... It's a, it's called Pump Universe, so it's a, a half of my shoe and half of Iverson's shoe. And it's great, because I, I still do things with Allen Iverson and Shaquille O'Neal. We'll do events around the country. We'll do either shows or signing autographs or, you know, camps and things like that. So Reebok has been very, very good to me for a long period of time. My oldest daughter, who plays in WBA, is a Reebok athlete as well. Uh, so again, to still be able to be relevant, and still people talk about the shoe 30 years later, and knowing that's your shoe, uh, it's a special feeling. I feel like you, you made an impact in people's minds and lives. And, you know, uh, you know, like you say, with Paul, Paul was the guy who invented the pump. Like, he was a guy that I worked with on a daily basis in Boston when I was up there. So to, to be able to spend some time with him, him be a part of Go Ruck and those, the company there that's based in Jacksonville, it's just it's like full circle of just amazement and excitement uh, to be around him. Yeah. Well, D, as we close out, the Jedbergs in World War II had to do three things every day to be successful. They had to sh be able to shoot, they had to be able to move, and they had to be able to communicate. Okay. These were their foundations, yeah. their yeah. habits. Yeah. If they did these things with the utmost precision, right. they could focus their attention on more complex challenges right. that came their way, yeah. Yeah. like parachuting into <laughs> occupied France and ar arming the French Real resistance, things. right? <laughs> <laughs> what are the three things that you do every day to set the conditions for success in your that, life? That, that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, the first thing I, I do is, is meditate. Uh, I want to make sure I'm right with myself. You know, I want to make sure I'm talking to myself, make sure my, like I said, my, my, my goals and visions and my behaviors match up to my actions every day. So if I do that by meditating. The second thing is that I communicate with my family. Like I, I, I communicate, and communicating is listening. You know, what do you got going on today? It ain't about D Brown. It's about my wife, who I've been married to for 30 years. It's about my kids, who are, are, are going through their pathways and sexual things like that. Uh, and the last thing I do, uh, you know, geez, you know, I, 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 I try to exercise as much as I can. The physical part of it. Being an athlete doesn't go away. You yeah. still have that competitive nature, you know. So part of my meditation, I relax, communicating, uh, communicating with my family uh, and my friends, mostly my family. And I got to exercise. I got to motivate myself to be great, whatever it is. Can I do a goal rug challenge? Probably not. <laughs> but I can go and I can I can be the best version of myself. And those three things every day make me the best version of myself. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. I love, love all three of those. Yeah. And if you feel like having a little workout today, <laughs> I think there's plenty of opportunities oh, over here. It's, it's, it's an amazing environment. <laughs> this festival is beautiful. To see all these people, to see the military here presence, the police presence, just the people here doing this exercise and fellowshipping. You know what? This is what it's about. Beautiful day here in Jacksonville, Florida. You got to love it. Being in this this great truck that, you know, listen, I'm sure there's a lot of great things happening in this truck uh, back in the day. To be sitting here with you, you know, I appreciate you having me on here. Thank you so much. I think I think next we got to try to see if we can get Shaq in the back oh, of this thing. Oh, my goodness. We better get some more shock absorbers and some more something for them. He's a big boy. <laughs> Dude, thanks so Man, much. I appreciate you. Thank appreciate you. Appreciate it. <laughs>
As a former member of Special Forces, the Jedberg Podcast donates a percentage of all proceeds to the Green Beret Foundation, supporting America's Special Forces and their families. Thanks for joining us on this episode. How you prepare today determines success tomorrow.